Yeah. So before the break, we were looking at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, where it says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The word that is used over there for schemes, uh, it literally means methods. There are certain methods which the devil adopts um, to, to stop us, prevent us from gaining our inheritance. So um, over the centuries, even as the devil has operated here on this earth, he has uh, kind of understood that certain methods work very, very well. So he uses these methods again and again to bring down the believer and prevent them from um, enjoying what Christ has for them. But this does not have to necessarily you know, make us feel um, at a disadvantage or make us feel fearful uh, because God only permits attacks which he knows that we will be able to handle. So God will never permit an attack that is beyond that particular believer's ability to withstand. This is a promise which God makes to us. Um, so in fact, if someone could turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, because even as we start talking about this you know, topic of warfare, it's good for us to know that this is the assurance that God has given us. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. 13. If someone could please you know, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, if you could read out verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except that as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. It is very clearly told over here that the Lord who is faithful, you know, we serve a faithful God. He knows what each of his children can withstand. And it says he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. To have the strength to just take your stand and say, no, I will not let go of my you know godly principles i will not dishonor the lord i will not disobey me or dis disobey him uh, to be able to just endure through that temptation and take a stand and say no i will not be shaken i will not give in uh, god will enable us to only face those things that we will be able to you know um, approach with that kind of an attitude this is a promise that God has made to us. So yes, Satan has got his schemes. He has got his methods, which he has you know, tried out thousands of times you know, over the centuries. And these methods of his uh, work well. But the Lord has got other methods which are superior to Satan's methods. So the promise it's, uh, that's given to us here in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, uh, you know, when we face these temptations, when we face these schemes of Satan, the Lord will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. He will show us how to, um, you know, uh, how to, uh, to, to withstand those schemes, how to overcome those schemes. He will show us what uh, strategy or what method we can use to be able to resist Satan and stay strong in the Lord when those attacks take place. So when we are faced with temptations which we feel are too great or too powerful for us to be able to bear, we must remember this promise that is given to us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Because one of the thoughts which Satan would bring to our minds is that uh, the mighty power of God is not going to work in this situation. You can't be strong in the Lord in this situation because this is something beyond you. You are too habituated to this temptation. You are too uh, uh, deep into sin. And so you will not be able to overcome. Those are the lies which Satan would speak. But the promise which God made is that he will not allow us to be tempted in any way which we will not be able to overcome. 
he will only permit those temptations those attacks to come into our lives which he knows for a fact that we will be able to overcome by the power of the lord the lord will reveal to us he will show us how to overcome it he will show us what method to use so we must remember and hold on to this promise so keeping this in mind knowing that the lord will not test us beyond what we can bear knowing that the mighty power of god is available to us and we can make ourselves strong in him knowing this we choose to put on the full armor of god you know verse 13 in where it says therefore put on the full armor of god so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground and after you have and after you have done everything to stand so all that is going to be explained to us in the next few verses has got one goal when the attack comes you take your stand and you say no i will not dishonor the lord i will not disobey him i will not lose my faith in him and you stand and you stand and you and you resist and you say no i'm not going to back down i'm not going to fall i'm not going to give way so it's all about standing because once it's all done and you know satan has uh, he tries his best and he retreats there you are still standing you have not given up any ground you have not you know retreated you have not failed so the things that we're going to be looking at in the next few verses all of them are aimed at one thing to help you to continue standing and not to fall not to give in not to give up not to turn around and flee so um, this is something that we would have to keep in mind okay so uh, the emphasis is on standing your ground and after having done everything to continue to stand and so uh, with this in mind in verse 14 paul says stand firm then how stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist if you're going to be taking a stand and remaining standing then it's very very vital that you would have to be wearing this belt of truth and so from now you know this verse onwards he starts using the imagery of the roman soldier because this is a uh, this is something that the people would have been very familiar with even as he's talking about these different um uh, portions of the armor they can picture the roman uh, you know armor in their minds and then they would uh, draw the parallel the spiritual parallel uh, you know of that armor when it comes to spiritual terms so they would know what uh, what uh, paul is indicating when he talks about the belt of truth uh, because the roman armor at that time was basically two metal um what would you call the metal plates you would have one long metal plate in the front uh, maybe uh, up to knee level maybe a little higher up above the knee so that you know you, it will not restrict your movements so all the way from uh, your shoulders right up to just above your knee you would have one metal plate covering you in the front and then you would have another metal plate covering uh, 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 you know at the back and so these two metal plates are held together by brass rings on your shoulders so it's it is not a very sophisticated um, you know armor very basic very simple you have a metal plate in the front you have a metal plate at the back you have brass rings which are holding these two plates together now picture a soldier taking his sword the enemy is coming towards him they are in hand to hand combat the enemy is using his sword and uh, attacking this soldier is you know stepping into battle wearing these two metal plates and he's fighting back with his sword what would happen you would basically have this metal plate shaking and you know moving all over the place and getting displaced the belt is vital without that belt holding those metal plates in place the soldier would not even be able to operate would not even be able to function this belt holds that armor together without that belt that armor would not even stay in place and so paul you know refers to this 
little piece of you know the little, little piece of armor the belt and he um parallels it with truth that's the you know um spiritual um parallel which he draws he calls this belt belt of truth you know when you are looking at the at, at maybe a painting of a roman soldier you would admire maybe the grander aspects of the armor you would hardly even look at the belt but that belt is central to the whole thing because that belt of truth is what is holding the entire armor in place and in fact the belt was also used to um, you know to hold up certain other pieces of of the of equipment for instance on one side of the belt uh, the soldier would clip his um, you know sword on the other side of the belt he would clip a small shield which he sometimes uses you know it, it's a small hand shield it's like a tiny little uh, you know circle uh so that would be used sometimes this is not the bigger shield which is going to be talked about later on you know in one of the latter verses so this belt also served to hold certain other pieces of um, armor in place so this belt of truth is basic it's vital and it's so important for us believers because satan mainly attacks us with lies he comes to us with half truths you know like he did with eve he will not speak an outright falsehood because then we would just ignore him he comes to us with half truths which sound almost truthful and he tries to confuse us and so if we are not sure of what the truth of god's word is it is so easy for the entire armor to get displaced it is so important for us to hold on to the truth of god's word and declare to satan and say no this is what god's word says and what god says is true and i choose to abide by this i take a stand on this and i refuse to budge so we hold on to the truth of god's word and we refuse to budge and when we do that then satan will no longer be able to attack us because we are refusing to believe his lies and if if we are not even ready to believe what he is saying he has no hold over us so the belt of truth becomes very very important the truth of god's word is vital once we know that this is the truth of what god's word is saying we hold on to it and we refuse to give in to whatever lies satan is trying to sow into our hearts and minds the second um, piece of armor that's being talked about is the breastplate of righteousness so this breastplate of course would be the metal uh, plate in the front that would be your breastplate and uh, now this metal um, you know it, it uh, like i said it goes you know all the way up to your um, uh, knee level um, so this is uh, he parallels this uh, paul parallels this breastplate with righteousness um, if a person is not rejecting sin on a daily basis and holding on to the righteousness of god um it's like as if he has taken off that metal plate in the front and is exposing himself to the arrows and the attacks you know so as long as a person on a daily basis says no to sin and holds on to righteousness it's like he's keeping that metal plate you know in place if he says oh it's all right to do it you know today is my day off i'm i'm going to just indulge in sin it's like as if he's just taken off that protective covering in the front and now he's completely exposed to any attacks from a spear from a from a sword from a arrow you know he's, he, uh, the evil one can attack him in any any way so which is why it becomes very important for the believer on a daily basis to say no to sin as long as you're saying no to sin and you're holding on to righteousness that metal plate is there covering you protecting you but if you say no today you know i i feel like just taking a day off from spirituality and i'm going to indulge in sin it's like you're literally just taking off that plate and exposing yourself to these four levels of demonic powers i mean it's a, it's such a foolish thing to do you know so we would we would be careful not to do that the third piece of armor that's talked about it says and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace so if you notice over here your feet are not fitted with the gospel of peace your feet are fitted with what your feet are fitted with the readiness 
how do you make your feet ready how do you fit them with readiness how do you uh, you know fit your feet with preparedness the preparedness the readiness comes from knowing your gospel of peace very very well the more you know it the more you have absorbed it the more you are you know your 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 life is revolving around this gospel of peace your feet are that ready that prepared to uh, to take a stand and refuse to budge so uh, he says you know you have uh, you have put on your belt of truth your breastplate of righteousness is in place and now your feet need to be ready because the attack is going to come and when the attack comes you'll only be prepared and ready if you have prepared yourself with the gospel of peace beforehand um let's first of all look at uh, you know the this the the shoes which the uh, roman soldier used to wear and then we will make a comparison with how that can you know um help um, how we can compare that to the spiritual armor uh, so these uh, roman soldiers uh, would wear this very heavy sandals uh, the sole of that you know the, the bottom of that uh, uh, shoe the sole of that shoe uh, would have layers and layers of leather uh, they say it's like uh, you know many inches thick so it the the sole of that shoe would be very very thick and attached to the bottom of that shoe would be spikes because when you have two soldiers they come at each other with their shields and swords and they hit against each other this soldier he you know he he digs in his heels and the spikes of his shoe dig into the ground and he takes a stand and he refuses to budge and he takes his sword and he slashes at the other enemy so um, that 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 shoe that heavy shoe that he is wearing with the spikes attached to it on, on on the bottom it helps him to to grip the ground and hold his place and make his attack otherwise the enemy you know would push him and he would fall down he would not be able to uh, uh, to withstand the uh, the onslaught so these shoes they help him to take a stand and not budge okay so over here these are not running shoes these are shoes because a running shoe would never have spikes you know it would not allow you to run the, the spikes are meant to hold you in place because that's the instruction which paul gives right take a stand stand your ground and after everything is done you're still standing strong over there why because you have readied and prepared your feet with the gospel of peace um so um let's look at this uh how does the gospel of peace prepare the believer uh, you know there are all kinds of um, silly things taught especially in sunday school regarding this armor of god but you know we are doing the letter to the ephesians let's look at what paul has to say about the gospel in the letter to the ephesians the word gospel is used in ephesians four times four times this word gospel you know the word gospel means good news the word gospel is used four times in ephesians one one of course is over here right here in this verse verse 6 i mean chapter 6 verse 15 the other three places where this word gospel is used in chapter 1 verse 13 it is used to talk about the gospel of salvation the good news of salvation and in the other three places where this uh, word gospel is used it is used to talk about peace 113 36 and uh, 619 in all of these three places where the word gospel is used it's talking about the peace between the jews and the gentiles in a broader sense it's basically talking about peace between believers so in 113 it's talking about um the the gospel of salvation and in the other three places it's talking about the gospel of peace so here in the instruction which um uh, paul is giving in uh, chapter 6 verse 15 he says let your feet be fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace 
So what kind of a gospel are you dwelling upon and you know, which you're absorbing and making it a very part of your being? First of all, you are really absorbing this gospel of salvation. This is who I am in Christ. This is what he, you know, he is releasing towards me as part of his salvation. This is uh, the authority I have. This, this is the status that has been granted to me. This is the security that I that I possess. So, you know, you literally fill your heart and mind with this gospel of peace so that it, you're, you're literally, uh, it becomes a part of you. This, this is how you think now. You think according to this good news of salvation. You act according to this good news of salvation. You are ready to face anything. The second aspect is that uh, it, the peace with other believers. So you are living at peace with them. There are no grudges that you're holding on to. Uh, you're, you, you're not you know, behaving in a hostile manner towards anyone. You're not harming anyone's interests. You are ready to offer help and support to people who are there and uh, who are in need. So even in your attitude towards other believers, you are, you know, clothing yourself in the gospel of peace. So now, because you have peace in your heart regarding your salvation, because you are at peace with other believers, now your feet are ready. When Satan comes and attacks, he will not be able to, you know, push you over because you will be able to stand firm. Let's look at the Bible passage, which makes this very beautifully clear. Um, Romans chapter 16, verses 17 to 20. If someone could read out this very interesting passage, Romans chapter 16, verses 17 to 20. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. If you look at this passage, there are two kinds of attacks that are coming over here. One is divisions. There are people who are trying to cause divisions. The other thing is there are people who are putting obstacles in the way that are contrary to the teaching which they have been taught. So the gospel of salvation, which has been taught to the believers, People are bringing in uh, the, the, the false teachers are bringing in wrong teachings which are contrary to this gospel of salvation which has been taught. The other thing that we see is that there are people who are trying to bring divisions among the believers. So these are the two forms of attack. And, um, he, uh, you know, in uh, uh, Paul over here in the letter to the Romans, he says, keep away from such people because, you know, they are trying to take you away from the truth. Rather, you know, you should be people who are innocent of such things, these, these wrong things which these people are bringing in. Be innocent of all such evil. Hold on to what is good. And if you have this attitude, then the God of peace is going to do something for you. What will he do? He will crush Satan under your feet. So even as you take your stand, and you say, this uh, gospel of salvation which is given to me, I'll hold on to that teaching. I reject everything that is that is, that is uh, being taught contrary to what the gospel of salvation is saying. And if you also take a stand and say, I hold on to the gospel of peace. I will maintain peace with my brothers. I will not give in to uh, this whole, you know, uh, to all this uh, uh, gossip and these divisions and this strife. I will not do that. And so in by doing these two things, if you keep yourself innocent of evil and you stay wise with, with regard to what is good, then those spikes with which, you know, the, 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 the spike laden shoes with which you have taken your stand, God will actually crush Satan under your spikes. I mean, that's literally what it's what is talking about over here, this God of peace, because you have held on to the gospel of peace. 
the gospel of salvation and the gospel of unity because you held on to that the god of peace will literally crush satan under your spiked shoes so why because you have made your feet ready by choosing to live according to this gospel of peace so the god of peace will do this for you so this is basically what paul is talking about when he says let your feet be ready all the time and how will your feet be ready by putting on this gospel of peace by absorbing this gospel of peace and making it a very part of your heart and mind and the way you function on a day to day basis moving to the fourth uh, piece of armor um that's verse 16 above all okay above all literally as in covering all on top of all on top of everything taking the shield of faith because this shield of faith is you're going to be holding it in front of you it's going to be covering all the other pieces of armor okay so above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one so the shield wow, at that time in those days was made up of six or seven layers of thick leather okay so uh, nobody would be able to pierce the shield with a sword you know there were no arrow would be able to penetrate through it it's like literally six or seven layers of thick leather that's basically a metal frame uh, you know holding the two all the pieces together you know so the frame would hold the whole thing together and then before the battle they would soak these shields in water because when you go out onto the battlefield you're not going with a dry shield you're actually going with there with a wet shield that that leather has soaked in water for a uh, for a long period of time and that's the kind of shield with which you are going out and um, it says uh, what are you going to be doing with the shield of faith it's going to it's going to help you quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one now this is uh, something that the you know the bible readers of that time uh, would have uh, understood very clearly so when these uh, roman soldiers would go into battle you know um, you have this uh, army unit moving towards the enemy the enemy is waiting for them you know they they're standing over there all of them with their shields and um, um, uh, swords and arrows and all of that they are standing over there and this roman unit is walking towards them what's going to happen if they just you know quietly or casually walk towards them the enemy is going to shoot arrows at them and they're all going to fall down dead so obviously they the when when this roman unit is approaching the enemy how are they going to approach they are going to be holding their shields in front of them you know and they're going to be standing next to each other so it's like when you know, if you have uh, 10 20 soldiers in the first row all of them holding their shields in front of them it's like as if they're forming a wall a shield wall you know they're all holding their shields in front of them and all the shields are together next to each other it's like as if literally there is a wall and they are walking behind that wall and then the enemy start shooting flaming arrows you know they would um, they would cover the arrow tip with something called tau don't know what on earth that is but that's what i read in the commentary and then they would light it on fire so when the arrow is shot the arrow is literally having a flaming tip and so they would shoot at this advancing roman unit but the roman unit is safe because they are behind this wall of shields and they are walking towards the enemy and of course once they reach the enemy then they know they will um, remove the shield and attack with their swords uh, then it will be hand to hand combat from that point on uh, so uh, here if you see um, you will have individual believers uh, whom satan is targeting and then you know you would have to fight your battle of faith but then there is also a corporate nature to this where all the believers come together and together assert their faith and take their stand so that satan is not able to uh, attack the church so 
there is an individual aspect to it where you would have each individual believer when he's attacked in his heart and mind by doubts by wrong thoughts you know he fights back with faith and says no i believe in the word of god and so you know uh, i stand against uh, the attack that you are you know bringing against me so uh, that's how he would face satan but then on many occasions uh, the, the 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 evil forces they attack the corporate body the church is attacked so it is very very important that believers come together and take a stand of faith you know especially when they when they having their intercessory prayers you know especially when they're going together as a group to pray over somebody who is sick especially when they're growing going as a group somewhere to share the gospel with someone in all these settings you know they're going as a group if they can assert their faith together and say lord you are on our side you are fighting for us so in faith by faith relying on your strength we are going to do this work which you have called us to do whether it's you know it's praying over a sick person whether it's going and sharing the gospel whether you know you're doing intercessory prayer together uh, for for some ministry that is that is you know fighting in battle somewhere so in all these things that you take up the evil one when he start, starts throwing his fiery darts he will not be able to attack because you have a bunch of believers all together standing shoulder to shoulder with their shields of faith and the fiery darts of the enemy are not able to harm the church and the church will be able to accomplish what it has gone to accomplish so uh, when we are talking about the shield of faith yes we are talking about individual believers asserting their faith and holding on to the lord but we also have a corporate nature to this where we together choose to uh, come together and use our faith to bring down the schemes of the evil one all right so um another thing that we see uh, you know with regard to the shield of faith um, it may not look like anything connected to what we are talking about over here but it is very very important um if we if we could have someone uh, go to first peter chapter 5 verses 1 to 9 first peter chapter 5 verses 1 to 9 uh it may not look like a passage about faith but oh my it's definitely about that because that's basically what the whole passage leads up to so if we could have someone read out for us first peter chapter 5 verses 1 to 9 please to the elders and the flock to the elders among you i appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed be shepherds of god's flock that is under your care watching over them not because you must but because you are willing as god wants you to be not pursuing dishonest gain but eager to serve not lording it over those entrusted to you but being examples to the flock and when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away in the same way you who are younger submit yourselves to your elders all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because god opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble humble yourselves therefore under god's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you be alert and of sober mind your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings and the you god know, of yeah yeah thank you thank you so much so over here this is talking about one aspect of faith which i think is very very important for the corporate church because in a church setting satan tries to divide us you know um uh, the people who are uh, who have been appointed as spiritual leaders and who are trying their very best to look after the flock um satan brings division you know he causes the flock to turn against the elders so they start grumbling and complaining against the elders they feel that the elders are not treating them properly uh, so uh, 
uh, the, the elders feel frustrated from their side. The 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 ones who are supposed to you know uh, submit to the leadership, they are frustrated from their side, and there's a lot of division which happens. And over here, the advice that Peter gives you know to the to his readers, he says in verse uh, five, he says, "All of you, whether you're in the leadership or whether you're part of the congregation, all of you." clothe yourselves with humility towards one another and in verse 6 he says humble yourselves you know you're clothing yourself with humility you're humbling yourself in what way you're humbling yourself under the God, under god's mighty hand and in verse 7 it says cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you because you see, with the shield of faith, you go into battle, you know, shoulder to shoulder, all of you holding your shields together to stop the attack of the evil one. And what does the evil one do? Strategy number one, he tries to, you know, split you up, divide you so that your shields are not together as one solid wall. So here, Peter gives you a very sensible piece of advice. He says, yes, there are going to be, you know, divisions sometimes. They were, okay, not divisions, differences. They are, sorry, wrong term. Uh, the Bible is against division. There will be differences between you, differences of opinion, differences of what you should do and should not do. When that happens, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another and humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. No, the, the those who are in the congregation, they choose to humble themselves under God's mighty hand and say, Lord, I will follow the leadership. I'll do what the leadership is telling me to, to do because I'm casting my anxiety and all the things which are concerning me, which are so heavy on my heart, I'll place it in your hand and I'll trust you. I will believe in you. I'll place my faith in you. So I will not attack the leadership. I will not attack other believers. In the same way, the leadership will not, you know, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a harsh manner, retaliate against the congregation. They will say, Lord, I, uh, we humble ourselves under you, under your mighty hand, and we trust you to work out these things. So, oh Lord, by faith, prayerfully, we'll try to resolve the situation. So both the leadership and the congregation chooses to humble themselves and cast their anxiety upon the Lord, and the Lord will resolve the situation he will lift up you know those who feel that they are being uh, downtrodden in this whole situation he will lift them up in due time and so in this united manner the they are able to withstand against the enemy which is prowling around hoping to attack so they are what are these believers doing in verse 8 it says they are being alert and of sober mind so understanding the seriousness of the situation, they choose to adopt an attitude of humility and hold on in faith. They submit to God with this attitude of faith saying, Lord, we will leave it in your hands. You will resolve this for us. And when they do this, in verse 9, it says, resisting the devil, standing firm in the faith. When they adopt this attitude, then the evil one is not able to you know, uh, divide them, defeat them, or break them in any way. Because they have come together in corporate unity and they are asserting their faith together against the enemy. Instead of fighting between each other, they are choosing to hold on to God and say, Lord, we are trusting you to resolve this. We are trusting you to promote our individual interest, whatever they may be, and, you know, protect our interest. But Lord, we will not fight against each other. We will wait on you. We will humble ourselves and place ourselves under you. And you, O oh Lord, take care of this. You resolve this. So um, in this way, uh, so that's, that's another aspect of this, you know, faith, corporate faith, where you're coming together, refusing to be divided, and together you fight against the enemy. Okay, so um, this is about the shield of faith. Um, moving on to the next piece of armor, which would be the helmet of salvation um you know those of us in uh, here in india uh, we're all so familiar with the helmet rules you know you, you go down the road you go down any road you'll at least find three four uh, uh, you know those posters which the traffic police have put up saying you know wear the helmet be safe you no know, helmet and safety uh, they are linked together 
So here, the soldier is wearing this helmet for safety. When he goes into battle wearing this helmet, he feels secure. He knows that you know no arrow, no sword can hit, you know, attack this vital part, his brain. He's protected, he's safe. So helmet is all about safety. And so this helmet of salvation is likewise all about protecting ourselves, keeping ourselves safe. What exactly is this helmet of salvation? In what sense are we supposed to um, use it in everyday life? You know, practically when it comes to actually applying this, uh, this spiritual uh, piece of armor, how do you apply and use this helmet of salvation? Um, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. What does it say about helmets? What, is, what does it say about salvation? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. First Thessalonians 5, verse 8. Yeah. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Exactly. So this helmet of salvation is the hope of salvation. You take away hope from a believer, the believer will just lose interest in their spiritual walk. They will lose interest in, the, in their future. They will lose interest in the things of God. Hope is vital. So the salvation which God has given us, it should fill us up with hope. We must believe that there is a future for us. We must believe that there is victory for us. We must believe that we are rich in Christ. We must, the, the hope which this gospel of salvation is conveying to us, that is absolutely vital. Once hope is cut off, a Christian completely loses um, you know, interest in their uh, Christian walk. So it is absolutely important to hold on to this helmet and see to it that we are wearing the hope of salvation always. The hope of salvation acts like a helmet. It, 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 it protects our mind. It guards us and keeps us from, from becoming discouraged and losing all sense of uh, you know, anticipation and excitement about uh, what, what God is uh, you know, offering us. And um, so if we think of it in that sense, um, you know, Romans chapter 15, verse, verses 12 to 13, uh, it makes a lot of sense because it talks about hope and it talks about how that can make a difference in our lives. Romans 15, verses 12 and 13. I'm sorry that I'm, you know, making you kind of move from uh, verse to verse. Uh, it's just that Paul in this particular letter, you know, he's just kind of very briefly putting in one-liners. But you know, in his other letters, he explains in greater depth different aspects of this armor. So it kind of helps us to know these things. Okay, so Romans 15, 12 to 13, if someone could read out. Romans 15, 12 to 13. Again, I say. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles shall hope. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, yes. I myself... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that should be enough. Okay, thank you. The hope that we have is this... That is the root of Jesse, this Jesus Christ who sprang up. He sprang up to rule over the nations and to bring all the nations hope. And that is what he came for with that purpose. Why did the root of Jesse even bother to come down to the earth to rule? He came down to bring us hope. So it says, therefore, because of what the root of Jesse has done for us, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace 
as you trust in him you put on this helmet and you say i choose to trust in him i choose to place my hope in him and when you have that attitude the god of hope will fill you with all joy and peace and in fact you will overflow with hope by the power of the holy spirit and your mind stays guarded you need this helmet if you go into battle with a sense of hopelessness wondering whether god will really come through for me or not whether this root of jesse really cares about me and my life or not if you're going with those kinds of doubts into battle without that helmet of salvation um the satan uh, you know the enemy can uh, bring great harm to you so we need to have this the uh, like first thessalonians 5 verse 8 says the hope of salvation should be worn as a helmet okay so that is the helmet of salvation that uh, paul is talking about in ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 and he also talks about the sword of the spirit um we are running kind of out of time uh, but you know uh, in the next class uh, we will um, catch up on whatever we were not able to cover regarding this armor because every piece of this armor is absolutely important for our every daily walk every day walk i mean it's not this is not just something that we do you know when we have a uh, church camp and we have a time of intercessory prayer these are weapons which we are going to be needing on a daily basis just to get through the day and be able to walk in the riches which are meant to be ours okay so um sword of the spirit uh, there are two three aspects to this particular weapon that we need to look at we may not be able to look at all of it but we will most definitely continue in the next class um so sword of the spirit what exactly uh, does paul say about it sword of the spirit which is the word of god now um the sword which was used by the roman soldier was a double edged sword Uh, so which means it would be sharp on both sides uh, because you know your kitchen knife usually is only sharp on one side whereas the double edged sword would be sharp on both sides um, uh, because then you know the so, uh, the soldier will be able to attack better so which is why it, it you know it, it was made in that manner and uh, uh, so paul explains that the spiritual sword that he's talking about it is the sword of the spirit which is the word of god and uh, so in hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 to 13 the word of god is described in fact as a double edged sword you know which is sharp on both sides so the sword is used in two ways first of all the sword is used to attack the impurities which are there in the inside the believer himself and secondly you use the sword against the enemy when the enemy comes to you with temptations so the sword is used in two ways it is used first of all to attack the impurities which are there inside the believer and then the sword is also used it's released from your mouth the words of god are released from your mouth to attack the evil one um so um we will not have time to look at all of this so just to you no know, dwell on the first aspect the you know, the first manner in which the sword of the spirit is used in hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 to 13 it says this word of god it's a double edged sword and what does it do it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow uh basically it is saying you know the word of god goes right penetrates right into the inner into the inner thoughts and motives of the believer and 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 separates what they think is you know uh, the what they think is their motive and what is actually the motive because it's a double edged sword is able to separate what you think and what is actually the fact it's able to it's able to slice those two things and separate them so that the truth is exposed so the and the marrow itself is exposed and you're able to see oh was this my actual real motive in in doing what i'm doing because we think that we are right but the but god who knows the truth knows what is actually in our hearts 
and so when this word of god penetrates us what it does is it goes to the inner being and it divides the soul and the spirit in the sense it shows us whether what we are thinking about our motives and our priorities is actually true or not and the truth gets exposed god shows us and reveals to us what is actually hidden in the deepest parts of our being so that's what this double edged sword is able to achieve so we are able to pluck out whatever is wrong over there and in that way we are able to purify ourselves and guard ourselves from the attacks of the evil one and we also use the sword against satan you know as an offensive weapon uh, we will have to dwell on that in the uh, next class all right so uh, let's just close with a word of prayer right now lord there is so much that we studied from your scriptures today um, help us oh lord to walk in the way of love this is central oh lord to our christian life if we are not walking in the way of love then uh, we are not imitating christ and then whatever we do will not have value and worth because we are not following the way which has been set for us by our master so in whatever we do whatever we speak whatever ministry we take up whatever we uh, we are we are contributing towards the kingdom may it all be done o oh lord um with an attitude of love in the same sacrificial manner that christ uh, set as an example for us and we pray o oh lord that even as we um, conduct daily warfare we will remember these vital pieces of spiritual armor that you have taught us about and we will use them o oh lord make full use of them so that we can fight against the enemy stand our ground and gain all the spiritual riches which are rightfully ours o oh lord in christ help us o oh lord in all of this thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you so much Thank you.